seconds probably. What I'm gonna do. Okay. Hi, uh, welcome to the sisters interview. Um, Sir Rifkin and myself are a pair of real life sisters from the kingdom of Ontir. Rifkin is a knight, a pelican, and a lion of Ontir. I am a member of the Order of the Laurel in Ontir. And tonight our guest is Duke Aaron Graves from Aitenfelt, yep. <laughs> also a member of the Order of the Laurel. Correct. So welcome. Oh, thank you very much. And for those history people out there, if uh, you go like, early 80s late 70s it was actually otten belts that's how they used to say it because from the sun god otten is what it was and belt is german for land that's what happens when you make a kingdom in the 70s and stuff like that <laughs> when they say first started we have no cool names like on is a cool name and all this stuff we just mixed things together back in the day so you talk to old Hans Dioran's, they say otten belt no it's and they now pronounce aiden belt for some reason because a little history for you because we're all hicked. Ontario just means the land, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it's not it all that cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we're like, I made a bunch of awards, like our third reign. We tried to, because we collapsed a principality, became one, because we made some extra awards to go fill those principality awards. And the board would send back letters to us about why this award wasn't good. We had to make it Egyptian themed awards, because that was our name, was based Egyptian theme. I'm like, okay. That's great. Interesting. So, That's interesting. Was, it was. That's yeah. super weird. So how did you find the SCA? What got um, you into it? I was in college, like a lot of people were. I was a geek. I played D&D, &D, but I also played uh, college basketball. I was a junior college basketball player. Um, I went from a center power forward to a shooting guard. That was very hard transition. So I lasted a year. I didn't play much. And then after my year eligibility was up, I had this group of friends I role played with, and we did some online muds and mushes back in the day on computers and they said hey you should come check this thing out on wednesday night fighter practice we think you would like it so i went out there and checked it out with them and it was aiden belts very Aiden belts practice back in the day had about like 95 100 people at fighter practice it was like a big huge it was an event every wednesday it was huge and i went there talked to some people and then by the end of that night for some reason some this group of people said hey you're a large guy you think you probably run things over and we'll let you borrow armor and i'm like i don't know about this and they're like no no well you needed this and there's certain parts i couldn't get and this one guy said hey there's a guy out there selling armor at this fighter practice that tells you how big it was back in the time and it was like a 100 bucks for a couple pieces of armor and i needed them because they had no uh like uh gear to that i could use as loaner gear so i had to buy that he's like how about this you i'm gonna buy it for you right now and i'm gonna you got these armor and then she'd come out and fight with us next week and we can get you going. And then if you like it, then you can start paying me back. I said, I only pay like, I'm a college student. I can pay like 20 bucks a week. He's like, that's great. But if that's only if you stick around and keep doing it, if not, just give me back the parts. I'll keep the armor and give it to somebody else. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I just did it a couple weeks later. I got into it. And then before I know it, I was roped into this group and been doing it since I've been like 19. I'm 47 now. So I've been doing it for quite a while. So who was it that gave you the... Oh, sorry. Who it. was it that gave you the armor? Do you, do you still know that person? Um, I, he ran out. Well, Craven knows him. I know you're interviewing Craven in a couple weeks. So he knows. His name was Zach was his name. He was kind of a, not a fringe SCA player, but he was a guy, just some guy I'd rarely met that night. I couldn't believe it. He's like, I'll help you out. He says, my buddy Eric doesn't play anymore. I kind of felt just in college was like, you know, if you know Eric, he's a cool guy. He says he, he'll vouch for you. I'll get you the stuff and you can get going. And cause I know if you, if you disappear, Eric can find you. Eric could. So it wasn't like a big deal at the time. So I did it and I was so amped to do it. And it was, it was pretty fun. I was really good at running things over. As if you notice my SCA heraldry is a Ram. That's the reason why I was good at running into things. It took me a while to figure out how to use that sword. If I could run things over pretty well. Nice. When I first started. So. And you're a lefty, right? I am. I'm one of those sinister people that you know they either curse or hate and i tell people all the time i don't have feeling in my left side of my body more because i did my early years i got hit a lot in my leg a lot and i'll i can yeah you could probably hit me now with a sword and i wouldn't feel it for a while it takes me a while now 
Do you, do you write left-handed too? Do you I, do everything? I do. Here's the weird thing. I write left-handed, but when I learned how to play baseball, I could throw left-handed, but I bat right-handed because for some reason they couldn't teach me how to bat left. I could bat right-handed. And then when I play basketball, I shoot with my right. Because again, that's who taught me how to shoot the ball. But I'm really strong. I know this is not SCA stuff, but I'm really strong going to my left. And it really freaks people out. I used to get like about six points extra a game because they'd see me shoot with my right hand and they play defense on me and make me go to my left. I went, sweet. And then they figured out I was mul- I was better to go to my left than my right. So I'd get a few extra baskets that way when I played basketball in the day because I used to fake people out. So kind of made them a little bit different, stuff like that. Have you tried to do that with your SCA fighting? Um, I fight Florentine a little bit, and that's about it. Um, I tried when I fight spear or when I fight with mass weapons, I'll end up doing right hand dominant with my weapons and stuff like that. I'll do stuff like that. So my brains, as I'm a lefty, my brain's mixed up. I've been put down by the man for years. You know, <laughs> I use le- right hand scissors. My mouse is on the right side, you know, and stuff like that. So I've been, been coerced in my life. So I've been I, always fought left handed. I ask because my husband fights. Uh, left-handed but he's really right-handed he fights left-handed because he had a an injury in his right shoulder oh i tried i tried it once it wasn't pretty florentine i can get away with it because it's not i don't try to punch somebody i tried the shield and i was punching people with my left hand i just was punching him with it and it (laughs) it doesn't work so i'm like at least florentine i can swing him around do stuff like that with him that's funny so this fight practice that was like a hundred people, is that in Phoenix or? Yep, it was in Phoenix. Okay. Now it's not, now the SCA, it's hard to say, back in the day, it was like, it's not as big as it once was. I mean, now we have, if we're lucky, there'll be like 30, 25 people and then about eight to 10 fighters. I mean, when a hundred people were there, there were like 30, 40 people fighting at melee practices. It was like when we, Stray was gearing up for us, we had like a mini war practice every Wednesday. Um, there was like, pictures of like 30 25 30 on a side engaging and that's like some people said some events some people had for war practice so it's always been pretty big you know we had that it's shrunk a bit because we've had more um baronies pop up over the years in the metropolitan phoenix area and they just pull people now twin moons is the big place to go you know you've talked to his majesty from our kingdom and his royal highness that's the big place to be at now and all that stuff. Where's my daughter? And all that Hi. stuff. Hi. And all that. So uh, we have uh, we have that stuff going on where it's got a little bit bigger. They're a little bit bigger, but they're not as big as those were. Those were like events every week. We had there were vendors selling stuff. We had some jugglers across the way. They were part of the SCA. They just juggled because we had the lights on. It was very much a different time. That was mid to late eighties, all the way up to about the mid mid to late nineties. We had a pretty decent size practice out there. It was pretty amazing. It was when I went to like I started when I got a little older and traveled and went to some fighter practices on the place. I'm like, you only have like eight guys. What's going on here? Where's like, <laughs> what, what's where's the practice? They're like, this is the practice. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm used to fighting like 15, 20 people at a practice and stuff like that. We occasionally we have we, we call it retro night. We have a, a gentleman, Duke Jonathan, who lives in our kingdom, tries to do a retro night where he tries to drag everybody out to a Wednesday night practice. So we'll have like 20, 25 on a side and we'll have a melee that way on a Wednesday night, try to drag people out. Hey, remember the night like it used to be? And Some people would actually come out in their old suits of armor the first couple years it was done. Then they found out why they don't wear them anymore. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing that anymore, so. We have that sort of same problem up where I live. Like it's just so populous now in the Seattle metro area that we have, I think four baronies within a one hour, um, radius and uh it's just split up all the fighting which is actually kind of sad because um we don't have the same kind of crucible that we used to have back in the day no we don't and then you know now the big thing is is backyard practices that's the big thing to do let's go to someone's backyard and fight you know we have a big one in this local edge of the woods that's um my my family's trying to keep me cool right now by the swamp (laughs) cooler um is uh we have a big practice we do on a Monday night that's over at someone's house. They'll have like 15, 20 guys show up uh, for that practice sometimes. They'll get like a ton of people to show up. Because what happens is they hear the king's going to show up to that that backyard practice. and So everybody wants to come to that practice and fight and stuff like that. So that happens on occasion. 
not the has like me, but it's when the king's there, they want to go battle and stuff like that. We have three baronies in a in a hour drive, and it's the same. We have a Monday night in Portland and a Thursday night in um, Vancouver, Stromgard, and then uh, out in Beaverton. I think it's Sundays. Okay. And so it can be kind of positive because everybody will go on not bad traffic days. <laughs> Everyone will go to all the practices, uh, but on bad traffic days, it's just it's not good. <laughs> I know we. I have, you can go to practice uh, Wednesdays, the Aiden Belt practice still, Thursdays, Twin Moons, and then Sunday is Sun Dragon, which are three big baronies in the metropolitan Phoenix area. And really from where I live, uh, the, the, the Sun Dragon, Aiden Belt one is about the max 30 minutes. And then the Twin Moons one's a 50 minute drive because it's all the way uh, like on the edge of the metropolitan Phoenix area, like Mesa is where it's at so but it's not too bad of a drive i mean really honestly it's not and i can, and then there's a couple backyard practices i can make if i really want to i one time i as i told people a long time ago if i want to i go to a practice almost every day of the week in in arizona i mean it was it was pretty 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 populated even in the younger days when i first started i i dragged my night on a saturday hey let's go to this park and fight because i mean it was college I, it was cheap i already had my armor so let's go fight. And we just went to the, you know, by the basketball court and fought. So one time in my life, I was fighting like four or five days a week. It was crazy wow. how many days I was fighting. If I wasn't working, I wasn't going to school. I was at fighter practice for like the first probably 10 years of my career. Who, who was your knight? Uh, it was, uh, his name is Duke Eric Von Stroud. He doesn't play anymore. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you know Nichelle White Wolf. That's Nichelle White Wolf. And you've heard of her. That was, they were once married that there were a couple at the time and that was my night. He was about, I think a year older than me. I kind of gravitate towards him as a squire because he played basketball too. He was a righty though. And he was amazing, amazing fighter. Gosh, he was amazing. He just, he wasn't one of those guys that would kill you with the great flurries. He was a very technical angle fighter and he was great at moving his feet. He was great, great footwork and just amazing to watch fight in the field. But he was my night. I met him at an outlandish and we met, hung out for a while, and then a week later, I had to become a squire. So, yeah, he was, like, very formative of my years of being a squire. You know, the fighting aspect of everything and stuff like that. He, Because whatever he did, whatever he does against me, I can do against everybody else. Because that's one thing he tells a lefty. Whatever someone can do to you, they can do to them and vice versa. So some, I started, whatever he was doing to me and beating me up when I was a squire, I was trying to emulate him. I, we used to have the VC, VHS tape player, videotape our practices, make copies and give them to everybody. And we'd watch video fighting back in the day. It was pretty funny. I had little videotapes. I had lots of videos that are now destroyed of me getting frustrated and kicking a trash can. It was full. <laughs> and my foot was like, ouch. So, yeah, I, there's a video that got recorded over, thank God. But <laughs> they always said, oh, we'll bring it back. But it, it never showed back up. But, you know, I was young. That was the big thing. I was 19, 20, 21. I was, yeah. I'm much calmer now. So I was talking to Alanon. Uh, like yes. a few weeks ago and he was telling me all about like how he sort of incorporated his basketball footwork and fainting and body motion into his fighting did you do the same thing i did i'm really good at backpedaling because when you play basketball you gotta run backwards on defense so if you're trying to relay into me i can backpedal out pretty well and one thing about basketball done really for me is if you've ever seen the game i've ever played basketball before they do a lot of defensive slides when you're really down low and wide well i can move my angles are really good at moving. And then uh, one thing I also, from basketball playing, I have really fast hands. Because from dribbling and being able to pass the ball and maneuver it, I have really good hand speed. And Alanon's the same way. Alanon's not this big brute of a guy. He's got quick, quick hands. Oh, my gosh. The way he throws a sword, you're like, yeah, if my hands were that fast, I might be able to do that. So that's why I'm the same way. I just My hand speed is what I play off of. So and I, when I talk to people about and stuff like that, so I try to tell them, I them think laterally and – you know, movement, and I always try to tell them when you step away, an angle is very important. Like, when you go to the basket, you have angles you go to when you cut on something on defense. Same thing on fighting. When I approach a fighter, I'll angle how I approach them and stuff like that is what I try to do. And it's kind of like from – it's my basketball mind, you know. It's – you know, and one thing also from playing basketball, I played against a lot of the same kids over and over again, even in college, a little bit of college I played in high school. And I would look and watch how they play, and I would – 
oh, this person's not strong going this way, or this person's not a good jump shot shooter or whatever. And then fighting just did the same thing. Oh, this person throws a lot of off body shots. This person always moves this way. And I kept like a little computer in my brain where I store things on people. And that's what I kind of do. Sometimes it works. Sometimes I remember and it's, it's great. You know how it works. Like I, the problem I have is in my kingdom, there's certain people won't throw certain shots against me anymore because I used to hit them. I was a great counter shooter. I was really good at it. And I hit them like, bam, you know, always in the arm or the leg because I'm lefty. And they try to show and I try to get them. And then I go to travel other places and I get walloped. So I'm like, gosh, dang it. They're probably thinking I'm not very good, whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're throwing the shot that other people don't throw anymore in my kingdom because I hit them. So then I get the next time I fight them, I just hit them with it. And they're like, how'd you do that? I'm like, oh, it's just reaction. I just forgot I can do it. Cause there's, you know, you've been fighting fighting, gosh, over, over 20 years. So there's lots of things in my brain I forget. And then I fight. I'm like, oh yeah, I can remember to do this and all that stuff. So but that's how basketball incorporates. Do you use your, um, cause you're a basketball coach too. Do you use that when you coach people fighting? Does it I do. the same language? It is, it is. Um, and it's funny, I coach girls basketball. So that's what I do, I coach girls basketball. So I look at the way I coach boys for a while. And for some reason I try to coach like my old coach and that nowadays kids don't want to hear that kind of jargon anymore, that screaming, yelling. Yeah, I have my moments still, but when I coach girls, it really taught me to reflect and think about how I talk to people. And I try to do the same thing when I'm fighting. Lots of encouragement, lots of saying like, hey, you'll get it. It takes practice. You know, you got to stick with it. You know, I, I do a lot of that. If that makes sense. That's where I'm at it constantly with them, just trying to ease them into it and stuff like that. So it does relate. And I try to break things down, you know, and I tell them, you know, one thing about fighting, just like basketball, there's no like great roadmap. There's not, I'm going to be good if I follow these five steps. There's not, I, I, if I did that, I'd write a book and make lots of money. I haven't figured that out yet, you know, but you got to find out individually each person is and find out what their strengths are and improve those strengths. That's what I do with fighting. It's the same thing with basketball. I tell kids that there's no right way. It's just constant practice. That's why you get better at fighting. I tell them, you know, fighting, I said, the reason why I'm good at what I do is I did it four or five days a week for like five, six years. I did, I treated it like I was playing a college sport. I was dedicated. I was in with it the whole entire time. I mean, I was knighted, if I don't know, I was knighted in three years. I was a squire for three years. I was knighted because I was pretty, I was good. I was decent of a fighter. And I won my first round a year after I was knighted. So I was one of those. In Aidenveld, we were, it was, because we're so even centrally located, even when we had some Artemisia as a kingdom, we still had a lot of, it was a lot, you live in the Phoenix area, you could fight a lot. So a lot of people knew who I was. I was a large guy. I'm left-handed. I hit people pretty hard at that time. And they were just like, okay, this guy's pretty good. And I, I, and I was just, I just, just ate everything up. I, I just could not get enough of it. Drove my wife, who was girlfriend at the time, crazy. Instead of going to the movies, I'd want to go to fighter practice or this? let's go to fighter practice. Drove her crazy. I don't know how many late nights I spent in Denny's after practice when I was younger. Looked to me late night. Drove her crazy. So did you guys meet in the SCA? We did. We did. She came. I was the local Seneschal for the uh the College of Brimstone, which is ASU, like that brimstone will serve the dog <laughs> and all that. It was and we had a dance practice and I loved it, you know, back then, it, was, it's, it doesn't force as it is back in the day, but I was always told, if you want to be a knight, you got to know how to dance. And I'm like, but I really like hitting people with sticks, what I want to dance for. I'm not, I'm not a big dancer still. So what I did to get to get that thing, is I made a Monday night practice for dancing at my college. See, that's what I did. And she showed up as a freshman at ASU and her rollerblades, came to dance practice, and she showed up and – dance with us for a while and I'm thinking this girl's beautiful she's never ever gonna want to come back to SCA meeting because in college if you ever did the SCA in college there's some I love the people I, I hung out with them I still friends with a lot of them there's some odd people that do it in college there are I and mean, there's odd we're all odd a little bit but there's some odd people there I'm like this girl's never coming back because there's some odd people that I talk to her and she's not coming back she's college freshman mom told her to go experience all these different groups so she came to it, and I had the greatest line ever. I love telling people. I tell this to kids. Here's my PSA announcement. Get involved in school because you never know what will happen. I, I, we went out to get wings afterwards at a local like pizza place. I'm sitting next to her. Like, How can I get her phone number? 
I said, hey, I'm the president of our local group and I need phone numbers of all prospective members. <laughs> so I can tell you when the next practice is gonna be and I can keep you in the loop. Cause we didn't have email back then. It wasn't Facebook back then, all that. So I can you know, get in touch with you. And she gave me her number. I thought, great, she's not showing up next Monday practice. So the grace used to call her on a Tuesday. She showed up Monday, so I called her on a Tuesday. Hey, missed you at practice, you know, dance practice. Where were you at? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, just too much. Blah, blah. So we talked for an hour and a half on the phone. I said, hey, you want to go get you want to go get pizza? And she said, sure. And she dealt with me watching the Suns game eating pizza and <laughs> hanging out a little bit. So I was like, wow, this girl really likes me. And then we were pretty much inseparable after that. I think it was my third year in college or freshman year is when I met her. So I kind of – she said they swept her off her feet pretty early on. So it was pretty cool. So that's how I met her. I tell people all the time, it's good to participate in things. You never know you're going to meet you'll meet tons of people that way. So, but you still sort of persuaded her into the SCA. I did. I did. It's <laughs> persuaded. She's persuaded. She's a, I've reigned, I've reigned four times. She's the only person I've ever reigned with. I've never reigned with anybody else but her. I've had people come and approach me because they think it's my wife that thinks I don't want to fight and crown again. I'm like, my wife could care less. Cause she comes and goes and does what she wants. She likes seeing her friends and good friends she has in the SCA. It's me cause I'm very busy in my life. Like, well, if your wife will let you, do you mind fighting me for crown? I'm like, A, I think the reason why I do so well in crown is I'm fighting for my wife. So that's that built up. Yes, I'm fighting for my wife kind of thing. I don't know if I can fight for And I will never know if I can really fight for anybody else. It'd be awkward for me. So she don't ever reign with. And she had uh, a good time being queen not because it wasn't because she's got to be queen. She liked being involved in everything, like the workings of stuff. She loved that aspect of it. She's also a Pelican in the SCA. And she actually ran a stray war like a couple of years in our, before we had kids. Now we have kids. Now she's a mom. And I'm a basketball, as you know, as it's hard. It's hard. We have three of them. And oh, my gosh. If I can make a practice now two or three times a month, it's it's woohoo. It's good times for me. So now it doesn't – because they've gotten older, I've cut down more in my – traveling as much my gaming as much and you know and fighting practice much it's not that sometimes i don't have a monday night free where i can go fight somewhere i get home i'm just dead tired Great just from, from living a life i'm like oh uh. i mean you inspire me with all your videos about working out training i'm like good to go i'm just gonna sit on my couch and look through my phone and you know i, 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 <laughs> occasionally and I, I try to hit the pal i do make a practice and i do that i'm very fortunate because I have great hand speed, so it makes up for my lack of fighting. So my hand speed makes up. I go to a practice on a Monday night and I'm, go, and I'm tall and I'm left. Yes, God <laughs> gave me lots of great gifts. So I can go out there and just hit people and they get frustrated with me. I'm like, I did win four crowns. I know I haven't fight that much, but I, I do have, there is a reason. But, so. but people always forget that, you know, you, you fought five days a week at least for six years. So you have this foundation and and you're you know lefty tall whatever exactly so well, I, and i see that because like i i tell them like if you ever watch retired nba players you never want to do a shooting contest with them like especially a guard because they'll still drain like 50 percent of their shots they take you know no one's defending them they're just shooting the ball yeah it's it, yeah that's not going to happen so i mean they're still they still have that ingrained in them and that's the thing i think people forget i mean i did this for i started when i was 19. You know, and I was, you know, yeah, I had a couple of years, man, where I got some killer bruises and beat up and yeah, had some pretty wicked stuff happen, you know, fighting wise, but I got better as time went on, but that's the big thing. I mean, it's some days I tell people, some days I have a really great day. I fight somebody and some days I get hit by everything, just how it is. You know, I don't really worry about wins and losses as much as I used to. I've gotten older about that. When I was younger, man, it was like, especially I was a squire for those three years, you know, you, you know, it's like, you know, both peers, you hear the rumors, all oh, they're talking about you in the circle. So you want to go fight every night. I have to go fight him. And I'm, my, my job back then was I'm going to punish this guy. So when he tries to sit down the next circle, he's going to have that bruise for me. He's going to be like, oh, you know, that's where I was. And I just, I had that certain mentality, you know, when I was younger, that is, I mean, I, I hate to say it, I was probably a big jerk in some ways. When it came, my wife would say this, when I put my helmet on and I fight, I'm a much different person if we were talking like we are now, I'm very focused, very ready to go. You know, I've always taken fighting as, as I take it as a game, not as somebody being, you know, killing somebody, but I have to hit that person before they hit me. That's why I always take it as, 
So I'm going to hit that person and they're going to take it. And if I have to hit them really hard, so be it. But they're going to take it and I'm not going to let them hit me. That, that was always my rule, basically my basic rule for fighting. You know, and I hate getting hit. I hated it. And so that's what other people say. If you hit Frank once really or if you hit Aaron once really hard, he's not going to be very happy with you because he's not going to want to get hit again. So that's probably the reason why it makes me – that's why I backpedal so well. I don't like to get hit. When Alon hits me, I don't like it at all. It makes me so mad. <laughs> Or even our king now. God, he hits like a truck. If you're a fighter king. I have been on the other end of that. Oh my God. Yes. And when the problem with me, he does that weird off-body shot. And you think you're out of range and he still hits you. Oh, my lizard brain's been trained over the years. Everybody used to come to my sh sword side. So if you go to my sword side, I shift my body to block to my – well, gee, I shift this way. Oh, look, my right shoulder is completely open to him. So it took me forever to retrain my lizard brain not to step that way when he was when I was fighting him. I did like turn my body this way. It just took me for, it was like, it was a constant. He gave me some great bruises on my right side of my body. That I, oh my gosh. Yeah, trying to figure that out, get my lizard brain. It's not that he was like, you know, tricking me out, shucking me off. I just, my brain would go, hey, go ahead, hit me on my right side, please. And that's what happened to me. So it took me a while to figure it out. And now occasionally my lizard brain will click and he'll hit me. I'm like, dang it, that really hurts. So it happens still to this day. So. Oh, um, besides the fighting part, like how did it, um, how long did it take or, you know, what, what did you fall in love with, with about the inventing part? You mean about the arts end of it or just? Just about... like the dressing up and the weird uh... costume and, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be one of those bad people. I was. I played D&D. I, I played red fantasy books like crazy, sci-fi books. But really my passion was for like the first three years, four years, even my first year of being ignited, I was so into fighting. If there was fighting, I was all about it. I mean, my name, Aaron, I worked at Aaron Brothers Art Mart. That's how I came up with my name. And when I lived at ASU, I lived behind a graveyard by Tempe and so graves because like, you, know, you always picked a name from where you live close to. I'm probably the worst historical person ever. I mean, I fell in love with this because I got to be a knight. <laughs> I probably did. Sorry. And as I told you earlier, my enunciations of names are awful. If I didn't say any of your name yet, because I'm going to butcher them. And uh, and uh, so that's it. Found it really. What happened with me was. Honestly, when I really started enjoying the SCA a lot more, seeing the bigger picture of it, when I started traveling, when I got out of like Australia War and I went to a couple outside events, I'll tell you one thing, my biggest event ever for me that really opened my eyes, I was a brand new knight. I took, I played hooky from summer school in college. So I was going back to school to become a teacher. And um, I went up to 30 year, up and on. Mm. That's my first event. That was your first event? Yeah. Well, I was a fresh knight with my belts and thinking I was, <laughs> I pooped it and stink and I was the best in the world. And <laughs> I could kill anybody. And then I met all these people. I met these newer people in the, you know, started, I got to meet people who started the SCA. And I got really good friends with a gentleman of mine who I got to know. He came back, Duke Arthur of Lock Haven. If you guys ever want to talk old time SCA, this guy is like originator of Aiden Belt back in the days. He is, is Mike Katie's his real name. He's a great guy. He can, like, you want to talk about, he can talk your hair, ears off for like five hours. He'll tell you everything <laughs> you want to know about the history of the, he's amazing. Like his brother built the first suit of armor, you know, cold chisel it. It's just, he's an amazing guy. Anyways, he convinced me, he should come to 30 years. So I figured out how to get a plane ticket, paid money, because somebody paid some guy to drive a U-Haul up there with all the camping gear. Remember those days? Here, we'll, we'll all chip in on a U-Haul. We have one guy that has no, not working or take a, two weeks off. And they can drive the U-Haul up there and we have our camping gear. So we took a plane flight and did that. Anyway, so I went to 30 and my eyes were opened at the game. I was just blown away. Just meeting all these different people. That's where I saw, I cannot remember his name. I think he might have interviewed him. He's a volunteer. Oh gosh. I can't Thorin? Remember. Well, I think, Thorin? I think it might have been Thorin. You want to hit the guy in the head and knocked him out? Yes. That was, yeah. Thorin. Yeah. That was like, oh my gosh, I got a buffet in the chest. <laughs> I watched him get knighted. I'm like, they carried him off. I'm even still, I know that guy. Who's the guy that got knighted that day? It's how bad yeah. I know that. Fiak. Fiak. I met him there. He was like chained 
to a pole in the middle of his camp because he was being <laughs> he was being he was being Irish and uh -huh. a Viking group. So that's what they did with their slaves. That's how he set his vigil. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And just my eyes were just boom. And just it was amazing when I learned. I was there the whole week. I was there from I think I was there like Sunday through Sunday. I was there the whole I, constantly. I loved it. The and I just, that story is like a be careful what you ask for. Oh, the knife <laughs> thing, yeah. He told me that afterwards. He's like, well, that's what I wanted. I'm like, brain damage? Okay, if that's what you wanted. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. What were you saying? No, it's okay. I said that it's been the whole week there. It really just opened my eyes. I mean, merchants, just talking to people. That's where I met Duke, Duke Bellatrex for the first time. He corrected my rap shots. That's why I do thumb leads now. And so when I first started to throw raps, because it worked here, because I'm tall and left-handed, I threw these big loopy arm thingies, you know, coming down. Well, I messed up my elbow at 30 year, so I fought five days straight constantly and i said he's like you look like your elbows hurting i'm like yeah because well i watched you fight you're a good fighter son but you throw your raps completely wrong i said well my arms hurt i might as well listen to this old guy at the time because i'm 22 I'm like we're sure this everyone's old, old everyone's old back <laughs> in the day and, they were old. and uh i was watching him fight and and he told me what to do and i took it home and did it i'm like oh wow then my raps got even faster and i'm like oh that was a neat trick i didn't realize that so it's just stuff i learned from there, it was just, and it made me have better appreciation for the game. And then, lo and behold, that January, I win my first crown. And then it was all in. And then I learned even more about the game, about being king. That really opened my eyes a lot. That was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was that was my first reign. Just, you know, you're 20, I think I was 23 when I won. So I was 24 when I stepped up. And just, wow, it was just very eye-opening. Because you know, all these people, Aiden Belt's very different. I don't know if you know this. The monarchy pretty much sets the agenda for the kingdom. It's changed a little bit over the years, but still pretty we're very much monarch dominated kingdom. The crown sets what happens. There's not like a seneschal and officers. Your majesty, you need, you know, come and tell us what we need to do. The crown set it. And that first reign I was at, it was pretty much how I could tell. I was like, I became in charge of this group. I was the leader of this group. I was just like, I'm 24. This is really crazy. You know, I have to make decisions make peerages, you know, I'm not just in my own circle going, Oh, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about when he knights that person or whatever. Now I'm the one that makes the decision that just really, it blew me away. It really did. It made me a very humble person when I was done with that reign, just dealing with the SC, what the SC was all about. I mean, the curtain was definitely pulled back for me and all that. I, I joked around after my, I think my first couple of years of being knighted, I was like, Oh, I wish I go back to being a squire. It was so much simpler times. I just <laughs> fight all day roll in maybe take a shower maybe not you know whatever and put clothes on and go hang out all night sun comes up i take a nap go fight some more now i'm like i'm in bed by at a, at a stray where i'm in bed like 9 30 10 because so i have to get up the next morning and try to function it just doesn't doesn't work that way anymore i mean when i was at 30 year man i don't think i slept at all for two days straight I just kept doing everything it just was crazy so <laughs> i was on this high just being in the sca at 30 that was like my greatest event ever i think to this day, I don't know how to explain it. People like you guys might be like, oh, it was a nice event or whatever. But for me, it was like, oh my gosh, this is from where I came from, just meeting all these different people. You know, the first time everyone shot rabbit blunts at me, I freaked out when it hit me in the chest and I almost fell over because it hit me like from 200 yards away. You know, I'm used to having golf tube shot at me from a, you know, a real weapon. Was, yes, a real weapon hitting me. And when it gets yes, stuck, yes. when they had a call hold, because we're watching them get stuck in the, in the wooden facade, I'm like, should I really be out here doing this? Is this really a smart idea for me to be doing this right now? But I was 22, 23. I was like, whatever. I was like, yes, let me, let me just come out and fight more, you know? So just different. What was your favorite thing about raining? Um, the favorite thing about raining is, is uh, when two things. I have two. One is, is, when you do when you do a really good job for the people and they believe in you so much that you really feel like you're king of something they really they just you you make it where they believe in you so much cuz you do things kind of right even though you might do something wrong they still they just they you know you can just tell and the the thing i love the most about reigning was at a court i'm not a big court person i i dread courts so it's really hard for me being king doing courts i probably had the shortest courts ever in history i just not big into them but I just, I just hate being an event, being stuck at this formal setting. I can hang out with my friends and talk, and that's why I was. I want to be with the people in the back. 
they're talking during court. That was where I was always at, one of those people. <laughs> but when you when you give an award to somebody and the look on their face, you know, the, the look and they hear from the crowd and everybody's like, it's an AOA or it's a peerage or whatever. It's that loudness. You're like, yep, got it right. You know, got it right. By the time I was done, my first drive was really bad about certain things and I watched some other crowns reign. So I kept a book and when I was ever going to award to somebody I got, I didn't know them very well, but I tried to get information about them. So I presented the award to them. I could tell a backstory about this person to the, to the people in the crowd listening. My first train, I was like, Oh yeah, this so-and-so you came highly recommended. Here's your AOA. Yay. You know, that was great. But I'm like, that's kind of cheaping it a bit. So I got better at my other reigns at doing stuff like that, which I think was a big deal. You know, but I, I love when you give that award to somebody and the look on their face, especially if you find somebody who's been playing forever and they don't have an AOA, you're able to give them an AOA. And they just think that's the coolest thing ever. And you, I've had people to this day that still call me their king. You always will be my king. You gave me your AOA. I'm like, oh, thanks. We're really old now, but oh, thank you very much. So <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's really, that's the part I like the most. I hate the drivel of the monotony of being king like the, the uh, warrants you have to sign, the meetings. Oh, I hate, oh, those those were awful. But giving the awards and seeing that joy and when the crowd of the people just believe in you as their king, that is just, that is, that you can't get a high any other way for me than that. That is just, it's amazing. It is utterly amazing, so. Magical. So, yes. So Greg from Artemisia wants to know, um, how did you feel about being a crown facilitating a subordinate principality's transition to kingdom? Ooh, that was, here's the thing. I'll let everybody know this. There were crowns back in the day. I won't bring up names. We heard about how the Outlands broke away and how Unstiora broke away from us. And it wasn't always this clean break. When I became crown prince, I told a bunch of people, I want our breakaway to be the most pleasant experience ever. I mean, I went to the crown tournament. I kept my mouth shut. I didn't say a word, how the crown went, how they ran it. I'm like, this is your guys' kingdom. This is what you guys want to do, so be it. I mean, I bit my tongue a couple times. I won't lie that day. I was like, okay. You know, but I let them deal with their problems. I let them deal with things that arose. I pretty much stayed out of it. You know, I went to a couple events uh, and stuff like that. You know, I, I, I told them I wasn't going to make any peers up there unless they really wanted to be a peer of Aiden Belt, not Artemisia. So I had a couple, they really wanted to be Aiden Belters. So we talked up there about that. I pretty much did my best to try to give them the room they wanted to become a kingdom. Because you know, by the time I became uh, crown prince, the split was already gonna happen. It was approved, was, there was nothing I could do. I was bummed about it, honestly, because I don't really like living in a kingdom that's just the state of Arizona. Really, we are. I know distance. I know this other stuff that goes on with it, but I really think for a, a kingdom to really thrive, you need lots of diversity. And that's hard when the vast majority of our population or kingdom lives in the metropolitan Phoenix area. Yes, we have outlying baronies and groups, but really our kingdom is centrally located. So really, you know, people complain about, oh yes, I have to travel two hours for an event. That's so awful, I don't know. And as you guys know, living up in Ontier, before you know, part of Canada broke away, that's a long drive to go for some kingdom events. Yeah, two so, hours is a day trip. Bingo. <laughs> two hours is going to fight practice. <laughs> bingo, yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. We've been very spoiled here in this area. You know, if I could go back into a crystal ball, really what should have happened a long time ago is us, we'd have been like one, uh, it would have been one fiery kingdom. It should have been us in New Mexico. It should have stayed a kingdom and Outland should have been up there. That's what should have happened. But I wasn't around in the late 70s, early 80s. I was like still in like, you know, third grade, second grade. So I wasn't playing then. So <laughs> politics were very different then. But that's what I kind of did with Artemisia. I try to stay out of it. I try to be hands off as much as possible. If they asked my opinion, I'd give it to them. And they were gracious people up there. I mean, I went up to uh, the last event I went up there as king for their coronation. I, you know, when the stepping down happens, I had people crying oh. as I walked out. And I'm like, all right, I did it right. Because no one's like, yeah, get that guy out of here. Yeah, it's our king. They were, there were some people that were sad to leave, you know, the kingdom. And that's what I wanted to have happen. I want them to cherish the dreams and all that stuff, you know. And there's some people up there now that think I was the evil tyrant. Aiden Belt. It always happens. It always happens. You probably can find someone in Artemisia go, that Aaron guy, he was mean. But 
I try to be very hands off with everything. Well, all the comments are saying really great things about how you handled the transition. So. Oh, good, good, yeah. good. I'm, you know, the the part that drove everybody crazy. Here's a, like a personal behind the business coverage. They, I blew everybody away because I'll tell this now. We gave them half of our kingdom coffers. Wow. That's why I talked to the exchequer and the center shawl. I'm like, well, they need to start a kingdom. We had Australia. Australia was still really big then. It was still growing. It was still, you know, it wasn't like they need half the money to get rolling. And they were, because I, because one thing I heard from back in the day from other people that broke away from our kingdom is the crown and the center shawl and those, they didn't give us much. So I went, so we'll give them half our money. They can, because it's half our kingdom leaving. So they deserve half our money. So, you know, they were very thankful. They were shocked by that. You're like, you sure? I'm like, that's fine. We'll, we'll, because Australia at the time was still really huge. And it wasn't, there was no, there was no other events. There's Australia or Penzik. It was two big wars at the time. So we're like, well, we have this war. We, our coffers and our Pyrenees get full from volunteer hours and stuff like that. It's not a big deal. So we, that was the big thing we did. We gave half our money at the time. And I really think it helped him out a lot. You know, I have some people that still talk about how Artemisia is still way too spread out. And that's why I always talk about it'd be nice if us and Albuquerque, you know, Al Phoenix Albuquerque were still in one kingdom. Because we're close, only like eight hours difference from each other. That's a hop, skip, and a jump. Yeah. You know, that's why they're having troubles, I think, right now in Outlands, because you have those people live up in Colorado and up in that area with New Mexico because of the travel distance. That's the big thing. And there's rumors about them wanting to have a split. And I just look at back, if we could have made things better back in the day, you know, I, it's always great making kingdoms, but kingdoms for a reason, not because I don't like traveling that far to see the other people in my kingdom. It's not always a good reason, in my opinion. So. so we kind of skipped over your knighting. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. It's, uh, it's super interesting. We, we have this like list of questions and we have to kind of reorient um did you get put on vigil or did you get knighted on the spot what was your situation um my i was knighted on the spot it was right before the last coronet of 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 uh for the prince valley of the sun i was fighting in it and i was going through the saturday morning workshop at mundanely it's like a college program for teachers, art teachers. And I missed a lot of events at that time when I was like a hot up and comer fighter or whatever you want to call it. And I was going to go to Coronet and I showed up there and uh, I showed up there to, to that event. And, um, and then I was offered knighthood and knighted before the tournament started because they wanted to give it to me in case I won. I made it to the, the semis in that tournament. So they wanted to make sure I was at least knighted because they were off, they wanted, they wanted to be like an afterthought. Like if he wins it and then we knight him, it doesn't look so good. So they put me there on, on the spot. And I was knighted right there on the spot. My poor wife was mad. My well, girlfriend at the time was upset because she had my vigil guard made for me and all this stuff. I didn't sit vigil. Either one of my peers, I never sat vigil. Either one of them. I had a vigil after the fact. So my squires get to know each other better. Because they had to guard me at my laureling vigil. It was after, it was like a pre after vigil. So, but, um, that's pretty much what it was. And I was knighted right there in the spot. You know, now you have Facebook and everybody's got HDR pictures of all their knightings and the slow-mo video. I have pictures in a book that are not bad. There's some on my Facebook page. I posted a couple of them on there. It was very different. Like, oh, my garb was – now you look at garb now. It was like I had a Viking helmet, and I wore a dag surcoat with my device on it, and I fought with a big giant heater shield and all kinds of things. Now it's like the faux pas would be totally not allowed to do now. People would be like – how dare you look like that? And I sewed <laughs> ghost jingle balls, little balls that rang. Well, I, they had a big clot of Joanne's fabric of these ghost balls, like smiley faces. And my balls, I, I sewed on the bottom of my dags. And that was my that was my fighting tavern. So I could jingle around and I fought and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was a goof. I was probably. <laughs> You're Sorry. breaking us. <laughs> Sorry. That's where I was. And I got knighted. In my, my tabard, my wife sewed this tabard for me. It's beautiful. I have it in a box somewhere. I don't know how many times she bled on it, but she hand applicated all my device. And I don't have a very, if you look at my heraldry, it's not simple, those rams. And she, and she's, you know, my time I bled on this, like probably a lot. And then, yeah, so I've uh, gotten a little more at period or more proper in the time. So I was a goofball, man. I was, I was awful. So, I'm <laughs> still a space Viking. I am a Viking with a heater, so. I, I, 
I just wanted to change to an oval. I changed to an oval shield because when he's being a lefty, when I fought this big, huge heater, I was really good at counter shooting, really great at counter shooting. Love to counter shoot people. And but I want to get more mobile and get more offensive. And when I went to the oval, it took me a while to figure it out. It was back to, oh, 30 year where I started doing center boss shields after I was knighted because no one could tell me what I became a knight. No one could tell me what shield I have to fight with. My knight was like, you can't tell me more what to fight with. So I went to this oval shield and try these different things. And yeah, I just, I loved it because I was more, I was able to move better. I wasn't constricted because I am with this heater strapped to my arm and stuff like that. So I just changed. And then my armor slowly changed over time. But yeah, that was my knighting. I was not on the spot. Get back to the subject. Well, so, I have yeah. to tell you, the, my, my squire, Inga, who you know, yes. um, I think I met you through her. Yes. Um, she told me I had to look better. And like, I guess maybe this was four or five years ago now. And your kit four or five years ago was inspiration for what I moved to. So oh. you, you did look really good at some point. I Honestly, that, that armor... <laughs> That rig I have now, I've worn that that scale armor I wore. I've now worn it now, I think, eight, nine years. I've worn it now a long time. There's been different uh, makings of it over the years, but I finally found this guy that sold aluminum. A bunch of us bought these aluminum scales. The guy was like, this is the biggest order I've ever had. I think we bought like 4,000 scales, like about 10 of us. There's like about wow. 10 of us in Aiden Belt all have this brass-looking armor, scale armor. I'm probably the one still wears it the most, but – we bought all this stuff from them and we bought these scales made from them and we sewed them all together. I've traded people who are much more creative than I am with leather and stuff like that. I traded pottery with them and stuff like that to, uh, make, um, to make pottery and stuff, you know, I'm making pottery. They clean up my armor and make it look better and stuff like that. Cause I am not anything that is not like, I can't smash it up or erase it when it's come to arts related. I'm in trouble. Cause once you make cut with leather or you do, so, Oh, it's, it's it's ruined and that's i'm not good like that clay i can crumble it up when it's still soft and start over if i don't like something or get it right again other things it doesn't work that way so i struggle I struggle on a basis with that so well thanks well i know i inspired some people yeah Armor. you're on my little pinterest board for upgrading my kit <laughs> uh, i'm now I'll let you know i'm now going through the process of redoing my leg armor i've uh covid did a good thing for me that because i'm getting older and i like to wear the big biking pants I wear shorts underneath them. And for years now, you know, I, back in the day, you used to, like, you strap your knee with, like, one, like, buckle and leather, and your knee pads, it's over, and that's it. Well, when you wear shorts, and you live in Arizona, and you sweat a lot, it, yeah, old age, yeah, I, I chafe. And by the end of the day, I'm trying to walk around. It's not pretty watching me. And I'm like a mess. So I'm remaking my leg armor. And hopefully I'll make it better. But I, that's, and I haven't done that in about 12 years, my leg armor. So I've been fighting the same legs forever. And they're beat up. So I've got new legs and going that way and stuff like that. So I'm getting that all put back together. So I do fight. Whenever we get out of this prison we're in, we can go back to the real world. I can go back to fight. I hope I have leg armor ready to go. So when did you pick up ceramics? Um, I was a, a, a painting major in college. I wanted to do large murals. You know, I want to be, you know, I did a little graffiti. Not again, not a whole lot, but a little bit. But I want to do large murals. I love doing murals. And then I, I thought, when I was going to college, I'm like, I better change my major because I met my wife. And I'm like, she's not going to want to live with an art, uh, you know, this bohemian artist guy that travels around everywhere that doesn't do much. So I'm like, uh, I better. So I thought, I'm going to become a teacher. I, I don't mind talking to people. I love teaching people. I like that environment. I'm good at, you know, discussing things with people. And I make people feel comfortable. So I'm like, teaching, yes, I'm going to become a teacher. So I went to school. And then when you become an art ed major, you got to take, I took photography. I took more drawing classes, painting classes. I had to take a ceramic class. I just broke my hand, fighting, of course. So here I'm showing up in my ceramic class with a broken hand. And the lady's like, well, you can drop it. No, no, I got to take it now. I don't have time to take it later. She really worked with me. I was not bad at filling with one hand. And but I couldn't start the wheel like everybody else did because I had a broken hand. We have to play catch up. And but I love pottery so much. I mean, I would just do it. I would, when I painted and stuff like that, I would go through these fits of drawing like crazy and then I would take time away from it. I would take a break. Pottery, I never get bored of. I mean, the first two weeks when we were on lockdown because of our schools, I couldn't make pottery. I had to go home, go to school, sneak into school, grab my pottery wheel and bring it home so I could do things because I was missing it so much. It's like, it's like 
it's an art I just fell in love with. And I love it, you know, because it's very tactile. You make things, it shapes. I was a huge sculptor for years. And then when I found the SCA, I learned how to make mugs and here's what I'm working on right now. Mugs and stuff like that. I don't know if you can see my lighting is really bad because of my thing. But I was floral on it. Yeah, yeah. I was doing stuff like that and I was like all about it. And I was like, learn how to shape this form and then found this functional thing I could do. And I was only in Arizona making stuff. So I was able to trade with people. I was able to add a bartering skill. So they always joke around about my laurel. They call me the bartering guy. I'll trade people <laughs> for things and stuff like that when it comes to pottery. So I found this skill, but I would like, when the Super Bowl was going on here at ASU, they closed school down for a week. I was hiding in the ceramics lab that whole entire time. Like I'd go home and take a shower occasionally. I'd sneak back on because that campus all closed down because the Super Bowl. I was making pottery when the Super Bowl was going on. I just fell in love with it. I couldn't stop doing it. I just love it. And that's why I kind of, I've been doing it ever since. I started probably when I was like 20. I've been doing it ever since. And all that. My meaning is so much. Can What's we look that? at one of the pictures if I can get it to work? Sure. All right. Let me see if I can get it to work. You have to go share screen. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> Grace, thank you so much. <laughs> My stuff. <laughs> I mean, this is modern, right? But yeah, uh, very much so. It's my sculptures. Yeah. Sculptures I do. So I just pulled a whole bunch of pictures. We'll just go through them. Okay. Ooh, so my early Myelica work. Oh, I've gotten so much better. <laughs> and that's cool because it's painting on pottery. It's like it combines everything. It does. And I've learned so many more skills now looking at this compared to where I am now. It's just. A, technology's gotten better, and I've gotten smarter at doing stuff than I used to be. It's just, yeah, I've really expanded upon what I do and what I do and stuff like that, so it's much better than this. It's still nice. I mean, it's still pretty, but I've gotten so much better. Oh, yes. You know, you know who that guy is? That's Duke Thorfinn from the West. Oh. He has the original picture. I thought it was such a cool picture of him at the time. He's strutting off the battlefield. Um, with his spear, like dragging a spear off. So I said, he needs to look cooler than that. So I made a spear going forward and I drew him with his, you know, he had the cool crest on his helmet at the time. He, he was like a rock star for me. I thought he was just a cool guy. He's, he's a fun dude to talk to. And he's totally uh, fun. he is, he's great. He's a, he's a bartender. Of course he's a. <laughs> he tells the best guy. stories. He, he does, he does. And he just impressed me and just, I got a fight next to him in Australia and I was like, oh yes, this was my like, made my war getting this fight next to him and stuff like that. But I drew the picture of him when he was king and then I got finally got to him one astray. I said, hey, I made this picture for you. And he's like, for me? I'm like, yep. I just went ahead and did it and made it for him. So the, I still the, draw occasionally. The first time I met him, he was telling this story about um, how Fiox felt a phallic hat was made and I was the maker, but he didn't know that. And it involves some pretty intense hand gestures. <laughs> and uh, it was really funny. <laughs> Sounds like him for sure. Sounds like him for I made these ones here were for our, our, at my high school at a volleyball tournament. And it was for their cancer tournament. So she came and asked me to make them trophies. Because she couldn't find trophies. I think she waited too long to get the trophies, trophies done. Because, you know, schools, you have to do purchase orders and get stuff. So she asked me. I made those like in about a week. I threw them all in one day, put them all together. Let them... Arizona's great for pottery because I can get a piece built in a day, pretty much. I built all those in a day. Had kind of stuff cut out, add them on there and stuff like that. I found this cool glaze and threw them all together for her, So, So somebody wants us to ask you about scrolls on pottery. Oh, scrolls on pottery. I did, I just posted a while back. I forgot. I did one uh, for a King's Champion. Uh, it was kids for, for our, our line of Aiden Belt. I did one for, they commissioned me. He's now, he's still king. Poor guy, call me eternal king. Um, he's still king right now. Um, he's, uh, I made it for him and they commissioned me to do it. I made this giant plate with the line in the middle and put his device around it. I still got a lot more work to figure out how to do that. It came out all right, but I've done a few things like that in the past. I've done some scrolls. I even made a laurel cup. Uh, I, had, I worked a, a, a deal with somebody. They, I made the, 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 the Roman, Oh my gosh, my brain's done. I can tell it's too hot here. Um, the Roman big, yeah. the big goblet looking things. I know there's some name for, I'm sure somebody will tell me in your little text what it's called. But, uh, <laughs> there's always someone to tell me that. But she came up here, helped me design it. Like I made the shape. 
she designed everything and I painted everything. So that's what we did together. We did collaborative work together and stuff like that. I've done some collaborations with another Laurel in our kingdom. Uh, we had it for uh, Straya one year. Um, we had, uh, I know it's not scrolls, but she's really good at my Elica painting, much better than me. And uh, so I made everything out of like terracotta clay, fired it, gave it to her. She did the tin glaze on it and drew everything and painted it. So we did this whole combination together. In fact, one of them, I went up to, uh, up to Northern Arizona, found some terracotta type clay and made one of the pieces out of the whole process. So there was a whole documentation. So we did that one year and we actually won that year because of their collaboration together. They're beautiful. I still have one of the pieces in my house, but they're really neat little uh, Italian style, like jars for medicine and stuff like that. She's much better at my than I am. That's I'm good. Great. Much. His majesty says he loves his plate. Good. Uh -oh. Good. <laughs> good. That was like, they commissioned me to do that. And I was like, oh my gosh. At that time I was like moving, they moved my classroom basketball season just about to uh, was going to start gearing up in some ways. I was trying to get it done before coronation. They like, they asked me like three weeks, three, four weeks before coronation. Could you do this? And I'm like, well, I'll try. So it was just a lot of, I got it through and it came out nice. I was very happy how it came out. So I was really happy with it. So I'll share some more pictures. Let me see. Okay. Were you apprenticed to anybody or did it just kind of happen? It kind of, it, it happens. Um, I really, the problem is though, in my kingdom, I had some laurels I would talk to that helped me like, uh, there's a Duchess Ariel up in Calentier. She's an amazing artisan as well. Uh, she helped me out with some ideas and some suggestions and stuff like that over the years, how to make up like, you know, your documentation, how to do things, stuff like that. But really the hard part for me, as I said, there was no one I could apprentice to in Avonville that was a potter. You know, my, all, my, all my were professors in college. That's where I did a lot of my work or at school because I was a high school teacher then and I was working on pottery. This was a set I made for somebody. This is another attempt at my Elica. I've gotten so much better. I'm actually making a mug for this line right now. Here, let me show it to you. I made, I'm making a mug right now for that person. It's a much better mug. Here it is. I don't know if you can kind of see it, but there's like... Here, let me, not, let me stop sharing the screen so we can okay. see it big. There we go. All right. Cool. Because there is this lion. That's his device. I drew it out. And then there's, he's a knight of Aiden Belt. a little thing. And then he's also a pelican and he's also a count. So this is me working on this piece right now. So he gets a little sneak peek if he's watching this right now or watch it later. Cool. This is what I'm working on right now. And that's the same guy. He commissioned that piece for me 20 years ago. That's how long time ago it was. <laughs> All that pottery. Is and it's still floating around. It's still floating around. I've seen it pop around with some people and stuff like that, which is really funny. Well, we there was a shield on there, but yes, uh, the, that was uh, Duke Jonathan von Trotha is his name. I painted shield for him. There we go. So I did that for him as well. So there might be some random pictures in here. I didn't have time to call them. Oh yeah, more of my modern stuff. This was me dealing with being stressed out. I thought this was super cool. So Thanks. I like it. <laughs> it's, it's somewhere in my house somewhere. I just threw a sphere, sculpted a guy. You know, you hear those times where you feel like you're exposed to the world and everybody's just screaming at you. That was the pieces based off of right there. Yeah, and you want to be in the fetal position just like that? Yes. <laughs> and just let it all go away. Yes. Oh, that, see, that was a picture. I, I took that picture, though. <laughs> yes. I did photography. That's my picture. See, I thought it was you. And then my sister's like, that's not him. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I didn't I didn't know he did that stuff. Oh, he doesn't. No, I do not. <laughs> I can juggle, though. I can juggle. I, you know, you, do you guys know who the tinkers are? You're the clan tinker? The tinkers? <laughs> you know, they are the tinkers. Yeah, I juggle with them occasionally. I was actually in their show one time, one time only. At some local Ren fair, I was in their show. They're dressed up like monkeys. So they painted my face to blend into there. My one job was to juggle, because I could juggle. And then they had one part of their, their skit where they got someone out of the crowd and juggled around them with knives. And the thing is, though, they have certain qualifications they want for that person. They have to be a certain size. And they're like, well, Frank, if you can lift them over your shoulder and put them on stage, that person will be perfect for us to juggle around. So. That's how I did that. So that was my one time. Of show that was the juggler one time. This is my newer stuff right here. Yeah, I love this. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, they're based off of a, a period shape. And then um, I went crazy with them because there was a great debate in our kingdom and other potters like, 
got to make things historical, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that can be boring. So I made this skull mold. I made the skull and I made a mold of it so I could reproduce it really quickly. And I just stuck them on there and made these cups. And I love doing that. So I love taking my sculptural qualities I can do and put them in functional work. I love doing that. So that's where I, this is my like, my, my little middle finger to the period police in the SCA. The authenticity and, and emphasizing the creative part. Yes. <laughs> I think people forget about that. You know, I also have more money now. So, oh, this is at uh, Clay Olympics. We do it at a local event at Marjan Ceramics called Clay Olympics. And um, I had to make a lidded vessel because my lid is the very, if you look at the picture at the bottom, there's a lid for this. I have to throw it. I'm the only dude for some reason that dressed up like Game of Thrones because I have a whole wardrobe. <laughs> I noticed that the most all dressed up, but nobody else is. <laughs> well, you're supposed to dress up. No one dressed up this year. It's like, okay, whatever. I, I'll come dress. I dressed up in my, I pot, I do pottery in this outfit when I've done stuff at events in the past. So, um, I mean, I, yeah, I had, I did, I think it was 10 pounds of clay. You're going to make a lidded vessel in 10 minutes. Wow. So that's me in 10 minutes of throwing. It's me finishing it up. I was done left. I took third in that one. Because what people started doing, they made their handles for their lids really super tall. So that's how they measure. It's 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 about bending the rules in this game. I made a good functional lidded vessel, but that's fine. I was okay with it. All right. I here we go. This is some of my more current stuff. You know those uh, those scrolls I made for uh, the, the the Greek style for the Middle Eastern dancer and stuff like that. I made one for her. Uh, I made it for, um, uh, Arius. You interviewed him on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, it, he, I made him one too. He has one of my pieces. I made frames. He made me a Pell. But the lady who I did the trade with, who drew on all the pottery I made, she made me the Pelican stamp. She carved it and made it for me. Because okay. I was like, I don't have time to carve this. I said, hey, you do this. How about you make me? She's really good at carving and making stamps. So how do you make me the stamp? So she made me the stamps. I have it now. So I can make Pelican stuff really fast. Instead of trying to draw them all out all the time, I can... I have a stamp that I can put it on there. It's a little bit faster. Cool. That's my it's favorite shape to make that <clears throat> that bulb Either. cup. Yeah, it's my favorite shape to make. It's, it's based off a Gaelic shape is what it's based off of. It's a Gaelic style shape. There's Scythian stuff shaped like that too. There are as well. <laughs> but the research I did was all Gaelic. So. <laughs> well. <laughs> and there's my mugs. I make it stuff like that. And these are all based off of... Uh, 12th, 13th century style shapes. I stylize them a bit. When I make stuff for like events, I don't really get into uh, production mode unless you commission, like I need 10 mugs, I'll look the same. Then I'll make them all look the same. When I make stuff for wars, my stuff is haphazard all over the place. I think people like buying stuff from me because there's no two mugs shaped the same. Like, well, you have two mugs that are the same. I'm like, no, unless you commission from me, I don't do that. When I come sell to Straya, like there's a lot of potters out there that'll have 50 of the same shape mug, which is great. I'm not knocking that. I have a lot less stuff I make, but I try to make individual pieces so you can f people can find individual mugs. That's what I try to do when I make stuff for my merchant events. I don't have a lot of similar stuff. I try to do a lot of variety. That's what Doing I do. the same thing over and over again can get really tedious. I do. I have a guy make, uh, I make, um, he sells honey. So I make honey jars for him. Oh, and wow. I make 10 to 15 of them at a time. So he buys them bulk from me and he sells them and making that same shape bores the heck out of me. I hate it. Oh, I don't like it at all. There's more of my stuff. These are uh, based off certain shapes. I think on the, the pictures with the spouts in the front, they're more of a, a Norse style. And um, I did like a black wash on the outside surface. And then I went back and put a white wash on top of them. One of them, I traded somebody for some stuff. I always wanted a sewn bag leather sewn bag and I made him some cups and I always want a leather hood. I have a leather hood. I can't wear it right now because I'd probably die in Arizona. <laughs> I have a cool leather hood and he, I traded him that uh, picture for it. And he made, I sent him a bunch of leather and he made me a hood. I've been trying to get a leather hood for years. Only time I wear it in Arizona is Estrella because we have rain occasionally. So it's nice to have it there. And there's me just making some, those are Saxon style plates. A lot of people, modern people even like these style plates because your food doesn't slip off the page. So they buy them for camping. You can cab around and you don't lose your food. So, ah, good of you, Rothgar. <laughs> he is my hero. That uh, is my hero. If I could be anybody in the world, when it comes to the SCA, it was him. Uh, my helmet is mimicked after his. The helmet I wear now is mimicked after him. He just, he's won three crowns. He's an amazing fighter. 
He's a very bright, intelligent man. Oh my gosh, when you talk to him, you'll you'll pretty much tell. My my two squires at the time were both brewers. He was a brewer as well, and he was talking about how he measures the certain weights and temperatures, and he's very scientifically brain minded person. And they're like, like, why don't we just pour it for taste? And they're like, he, they're like, we sat down after they went, he went to bed. He's like, he's way beyond us. I'm like, yeah, he sounds like <laughs> way more about brewing. He goes, yes. So he's a great guy. Like if I'm ever having a bad time in the SCA or I'm having a bad moment, I talk to him. The funny part about that picture, I'm whining about, because I just lost the cancer journey. I'm like, oh man, I don't fight enough. I suck. I'm not any good anymore. And he's like, dude, you just showed up and fought. I know you don't fight as much as you used to. You made it to the semis. You know, it's okay for other people to win. I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. I should, shouldn't be so mad about it. And the guy I fought thought I was mad at him. I'm like, no, I'm mad at myself because I lost. You know, that's all. That's still probably the hardest thing for me when it comes to fighting is I'm still really competitive. I may not show it very well all the time, but I'm still very competitive. And I was like, ah, I hate losing. So <laughs> I'll still lose, but I hate it. He, he was like, a hard get. Hey, Don, do you, or Ishaxi, do you see all that Scythian embroidery on there? Yes, yeah. I have seen that tunic before and admired it before. PSA, if everyone wants to make me one, I'll do a trade with them, just FYI. Just throw <laughs> it out there. Suppose <laughs> you got a barter, got a trade. Uh, my great pumpkins. Yeah, your pumpkins are awesome. Thank you. I got I got started making pumpkins. I made these all at home, by the way, during during quarantine. These are all made at home. Oh, cool. And I made them all at home. So um, what happened was that, that Clay Olympic picture you saw me throwing, they had, a, they had to make a jack-o'-lantern in 10 minutes. You had to make, and then you had like another 15 minutes after, after it sat for a couple hours to add a face and carve it out and do things to it. They gave you like about 20, 25 minutes to work on it. And then they, so that's how I got started making these. I did it as like practicing for this event. And then there's this guy out there, this uh, Chinese artist who makes pumpkins on the wheel. They're much more prettier than mine. He makes these beautiful pumpkins. And then I lost, I did the style, but I'm making jack-o'-lanterns. So I started cutting them apart, carving faces. And then I figured out how to make like, look like Jack Skellington and Oogly Boogly from there. So they're become big selling items for me. Don't let Disney know. <laughs> then, you know I might get a cease and desist order, but, but they don't look quite, they're my inspiration. They're not, I'm not doing them as knockoffs. Oh, there's some more recent stuff there I just got done making. And that's just getting my stamp coming in handy. And those are almost done. They're, I have to fire them this next, this sometime this week. I'm trying to get these other stuff painted so I can do another kiln fire. And these, they're all done. It's gonna, it's gonna be put in the kiln to be fired. Did you bring a kiln home too? I did not. What I did is, um, I packed everything in boxes really, really well with lots of paper, and um, and then I would take them back to school and very carefully drive to school and unload them and pack them in my kiln at school. I, I used to have a kiln that fell apart, and I won't lie, I used my school one. To have them at school i'm like well you know i fill it with kids work and stuff like that so you know i, I consider part of the job perks there's some cups i made for my house my wife didn't like them so i sold them i brought them home she's like i don't like them i'm like great well you only person can tell me that so she <laughs> thought the rims were too thick so i'm like all right so i sold them dirt cheap because i was i was heartbroken and crushed oh i didn't like my pottery it's okay you know that's fine but i just sold them. i want them out of my house i gotta drop them off at somebody somebody's house that they're all packed up in a box so I had like two more pictures, but I think we're good. Okay. So, um, I'm taking a bite of something. Hope you don't mind. No, don't. You have, made a dessert. No, go for it. Um, do you have any apprentices? I had one. It was totally weird. She took pottery. I don't know if you met Don Gall, right? Yeah. His wife, Iona, was my apprentice for years. She's the only one I ever took because it's hard for me to teach what I do. And I won't lie to you. I'm a school teacher. I do, I teach it all day long. And it's like the last thing I really want to do And pottery really, people get this weird misconception that in about an afternoon, you can show me how to make a pot on the wheel. No, it's not going to be that way. As you know, there's someone shaking their head right now. It takes a lot of practice. And unless you have a wheel and you're able to do it on a regular basis, you're not, I mean, I, I help people out. Like I tell them what, what materials to buy. You know, Maneka, I've helped out over the years with some stuff. She's got some stuff I don't have, you know, can't get a hold of where she takes classes. But I really never had them that way because I'm always known as Duke Aaron. Oh, you're Laurel too. Yeah, I'm a Laurel too. And that's the thing. But she was my apprentice for you. She just got Laureled two years ago for belly dancing. You can tell I always joke around, I'm like, yep, she'll all her moves to her. She knows all the moves because of me. No. 
She's a very talented woman, and she did pottery on the side. And it was a way for her husband at the time to again get her his wife more involved a little bit. And she was my apprentice for years. And then uh, we had a crown that finally came out that was more accepting of Middle Eastern dance and stuff like that. And we had a drummer who got world as well for Middle Eastern dancing. I know that's like the big taboo of the world is you know Middle Eastern dancing in, in the SCA, but she's a very talented woman and she makes some pretty cool pottery. She doesn't make pottery as much as she used to. She doesn't sew as much as she used to, but she always was my apprentice. And she used to joke around, if I ever tried to have another apprentice, they, she'd eat them. That was always her joke. I'd eat them if you have So I was saying, I actually I joked around. I said Phoebe was my apprentice for years. That was my joke. I had Phoebe. Because she moved away from her apprentice. I'm like, I'll take care of you, Phoebe. I'll be there for you. It was the joke. I said, because it was getting, because it got Iona, Dongal's wife, all furious. Like, you, she's I'm like, yeah, she's my apprentice now. And she was like, well, I'm going to have to eat her. I'm like, you probably will. I'll let you guys fight about it later. So, but that's just <laughs> goofy things that go on. So, I really have only had one. I have like one squire who's active now. I have one. I, I'm, you know, you think all these these dukes have been crowned multiple times. Oh, yes. All my squires have become knights. I have one that got knighted, and he was a heck of a fighter way before I ever got a hold of him. He's an amazing melee fighter, amazing spearman, amazing guy. He runs ultra marathons still to this day. So his workout is go run 80 miles or whatever. He's one of those people. He's crazy. Um, he's only got knighted. I had another guy that probably could have got knighted, but he moved away. And he got his, he's my PhD guy. He did a PhD in like Reformation of, of 13th century Sweden. That's what his PhD is all about, Reformation of Sweden. He was going to do it on like sax, like early Viking stuff, but to make himself more accessible to colleges, that was what they wanted. Not now, like if you probably going to school now, you've probably been snatched up because all the TV shows and everything else, all Viking stuff, and everything else. But back then we did him. He went to, he can speak like five languages. Anyways, that's that's one of my squares. Gunnar, he's a great guy, but he moved away. Um, I have one now. It's just it's time is busy. Is a family, so time and works hard for him to get out there much. I've had a couple of others that faded through the years. I've only had one that's ever been knighted. You know, I'm not, my success rate is not very high, but I could probably guess I'm more of a laid back guy. I'm not a very much, I, I pretty much tell people where my squires and my the press I had, I'm like, I'm there to help you, but you got to have the inspiration, the motivation to follow through. I can't push you. I mean, I have three kids of my own. I don't need any more kids. You know, and I'm someone who's close to my age. It's hard to do that. So like Craven, you're gonna in a couple weeks. He's really good with squires. He has a lot of people have been knighted over the years through him. There's a bunch of guys that have been I've never been one of those people that I call I'm not a knight or outer person. Knight or outer? A knight or outer, whatever it is. I don't I don't I help a lot of other people along the way that aren't my squires, but I'm a big believer as a as as a as an artisan and a, as a knight. I don't have to have a, an apprentice or squire. I'll train anybody or answer any questions anybody wants to ask me. I'm not a big believer in collecting or taking on people. I have like three kids. You know, that's a lot for me right now to make sure they're doing right. And, you know, that, that end of it, I just don't, I don't have a ton of them. You know, it's not that I don't, not, 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 I'm not looking for them. I just don't go, you know, I'm not as active as I once was raising kids, coaching basketball. So I really feel bad if I take someone as an apprentice or, you know, or a squire, if I'm not at every event, like I should be and stuff like that. It's hard for me to do that. If I make four events a year, it's a good year. That's sad to say, but that's just how it is for me. Nothing bitter about the SCA. I have no bitterness or anything like, oh, they were awful to me. People were mean. It's just, I have a life and it's outside the SCA. It's a different direction. You know, as we, I talked to you guys earlier about it. I love to move up the Pacific Northwest someday when my kids are almost done with school. I'm not going to coach basketball when I move up there. So I'll be some old fighter guy up there, you know, probably travel around all these practices, hopefully not having my armor rust because it's more humid up there and stuff like that. So that's my goal. I mean, I look at this way, the way I've somewhat taken care of myself. I think I can, I think I got about maybe 10 more years of fighting in me still. I think I fight till I'm 60. I really feel that way. I mean, I take pretty decent care of myself. I don't know if I'll fight as much, but I still like I can do it. So I'm not, you know, I don't have too many. I have more injuries from playing basketball than I do from fighting, which is crazy. Yeah. I think when your kids are school aged, I mean, it, your focus should be. On your kid totally agree i mean i know you interviewed uh i saw one interview we interviewed the two brothers gabe and uh his brother so so i interviewed those two i mean it's why i'm the same way with my kids 
my daughter likes it because she can come help serve feast. She's 11 now. She comes serve feast and be involved, wear the pretty dresses. My two boys, my oldest, who's in, he's like, I don't wear dresses, dad. He looks at my tunes, I don't wear that. And I took him to a couple events. My wife tried to take him to an event where I was at an event and she ended up snatching him and taking him home. Cause he was, he found some poor kid. My oldest is very smart and he's very sarcastic. And he figures out how to wind people in certain directions. And he was, this is when he was like in fifth grade, sixth grade, wind this poor kid up. And my wife's got tired of him in the middle of the battle we're about to salute each other to fight. My wife's, that's it, I'm done, grabs him. And I'm like, the whole fight stops. You see my wife dragging my son off. And I'm like, oh, he's in trouble. And then the guy about to fight goes, you need to talk to your wife. I'm like, no, I'll talk to her later. My son probably did something. We need to work it out. So he would show up occasionally, but it wasn't, he, he, he was in our last reign when he was really little. So he wore the little outfits, but the older he's got, he wants nothing to do with it, nothing. And my middle child, he'd rather play basketball or soccer or something like that. My daughter will go to meet events occasionally, but they, they don't think it's cool. So I'm not gonna force them to do something. That's my hobby. That's my dream. You know, that's my big thing. So my weekends are spent at basketball games or doing some event with them or taking them hiking or something like that. It's normally what I do. Totally get it. Yep. Yeah, my, uh, I have one, my daughter's kind of into it. She's the one who's been sitting at the pottery wheel for a couple hours every day. And our son will go to events if he can game while he's there, but otherwise he's not really interested. So. And my daughter will go if her cousins are going to be there. <laughs> like she likes shopping on Merchants Row. Yep. And gaming with her cousins, and that's about yep. it. <laughs> my my younger my young daughter likes doing that too. When my wife would come out to an event, she's like, "Oh, we're gonna go see Daddy when he's merchanting." Yes. Oh, I can walk Merchants Row and see all the cool stuff. And everything else that's one thing she likes that too i think all kids do there's a group i used to go to lily's every year in calentier the group i used to camp with all their kids have grown up now they're not at the house anymore they'd make one tent for all the kids would sleep and they would sit in the tent in kansas city missouri sweating but they'd game all day long D, &D magic whatever that's what they would do that's the only they get to go to bed is get their own tent to game all day that's yeah. what they used to do so i think that's what kids want to my oldest nothing He's into engineering and, you know, what the latest rapper is and what cool shoes to buy. And he's into that thing. You want to talk about shoes, he's the guy to talk to. What the retro <laughs> shoe wear and stuff like that. Hopefully, stuff, he, hopefully he gets a job to support that habit because that's not cheap. Well, he wants to be an aeronautical engineer. So we'll see if that happens. If that happens, he can take care of me too. So. He's set, yeah. <laughs> he wants to move up to the Pacific Northwest. He wants to work at Boeing what he wants to do. Let's try to get an internship there and do that. So that's what he wants to do. So that's his dream. Or work for Nike. Those are his two big dreams to do. Well, that's a good thing to do here because we've got Nike. So. Yep. Oh, he knows it. Trust <laughs> me. He knows it all too well. He wants to move to Beaverton right there. He's like, when we move, we move, Dad. Can we move to Beaverton? Because that's where Nike, yeah, that's where the, the, the factory is. I'm like, okay. Because my wife has a cousin who works there. He's in IT. So he uh, talks about all the time about Nike. He's oh, Dad, this place is so cool. I'm like, Glad yeah, you like know, Casimir works there too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I know Kaz very well. Somebody wants to know how many helmets do you own? Oh my God. These are people I know in the kingdom. Um, I have now one, two, three, four, five, seven. Seven helmets. Wow. But I haven't bought a new helmet. Well, I haven't got a new helmet. I don't say I bought it. I haven't bought a new helmet in about, I think it's 12 years. My early part of me, I see I've got great helms i've got all kinds of, i had this fad where i thought i could build helmets no i'm not i'm not good with metal so no 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 do you have kits that go with all the different kinds of helmets i did for three of them i have a phrygian helmet i got a not wolf helmet and then i wore that my last reign if you see pictures of me when i was king last time i had the phrygian swoop helmet and all that stuff with my scale because i love scale armor and I had that whole rig. Someone made me cool little boots, spats to put over my fake boots, little scale shoes. And I love that rig. That was a cool rig. And I got it. A friend of mine was a worked for a company, so he had me. He took the metal shovel face and got it electric plated, so it's brass looking. So it's not quite as heavy as actual piece of brass. So I have that rig I could wear. I can actually interchange it with the rig I have now. It's pretty similar to my rig I had because I do like Eastern Rus. I'm doing now because I thought the armor looked cool. Not because I have any connection with Eastern Russian 
persona. I just like the armor. It looks cool. It's super cool. The helmets are badass. Exactly. That's why I like it. I have nothing. I mean, that's the thing about it. I used to have a, a kettle hat. I used to wear and be English and talk to people like, you know, let's parlay, parlay. Like I used to do all the time on the battlefield. I did that one. That one I, I sold. And then I have a couple great helms. And then I have a couple old Viking helmets that uh, was by Winrose Armory. Winrose Armory built about three of my helmets. I still have an old Viking one. Um, there's a couple on my website. It's, you know what kills me? I, uh, I just shake my head at this. I had a chance to buy a Torgal helmet a long time ago. And like when he was starting to like leave making stuff, and that was like my biggest thing I always regret in my life is not having a Torgal helmet. I know they're not period, they're not, but they're so beautiful. I always wanted one and I had a chance to buy one and he really wasn't too badly priced at the time. I just didn't do it. And I, I kicked myself to this day. But anyways, so I have a couple of those helmets. I have a great helm. I wore it one time when I was king. I Because, you know, I was king. I had to look, you know, like I was kingly. And that was a great helm. And then um, I have uh, my helmet I have now, which I've worn the most, which is made by Dongal and all that stuff. I'm trying to work a deal out with Dongal right now for maybe I'll get another helmet eventually. <laughs> stuff, well, so. Torgal is still making stuff. He just doesn't around the SCA much. No, he doesn't. He's a cool guy. I actually hear I, I say this because I knew you live up in there. I have a belt. Fiak, the one who got knighted at 30, right? Did I say his name right? Yeah. He, uh, he met my wife when she was crown prince because he went. she went to Torgal's booth. And you can tell, you knew, if you guys know Torgal at all, you can tell this really, he took a lot of pride with my wife on this and because he had these belts made. I think he was selling for like, I don't know what the price was. She never would tell me. But um, she went and said, do you have one who's white? And Torgo looked at her like, I don't have any white belt, this man. And she's like, oh, okay. And, he's, and you can see him like, she told me the guy was like, she told me at first, like, he wasn't happy I asked him that. But then he <laughs> kind of sighed and said, if you can find white leather, I'll make one on site for you. I'll put the belt together and put it all together for you if you pay X amount of more money. She's like, okay. So Fiox was there talking to him, got up with my wife. I kind of knew him a little bit at 30 when I met him. And as I was crown prince at Estrella, took my wife around to find the right leather and all this stuff for this belt. And so I had this belt to stay. It's probably the one belt I'll never give away in my whole entire life. Because it's still a Torgo belt. All these, yeah, you can't you can't get one of these anymore. So it didn't fit. She bought it for me. It never fit my persona at the time. She thought the belt just looked really cool. And I wore, cool. Yeah, they are. So I made a persona outfit to match my belt, which is pretty funny, I think. So I'm actually talking to him about interviewing him. So we'll see if uh, if I can land it. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> Tell him there's a lot of people out there that really regret never buying one of his helmets. Me, one of them. Yeah, I, I, I think he, he knows a lot of really cool things to talk about too. You know? Oh, he's an amazing guy. I got to talk to him once. That's about the whole helmet conversation. It's about art in general. Oh my gosh, the guy is just, he's like, here we are on this plane. And he's like here Yeah. when it comes to thinking. I think anyways, I was just, I was memorized by him. He's a cool, I thought he was a cool, for a 24 year old kid at the time, getting to meet him, I was like, this guy is amazing. Yeah. I met him at 30 years, I met him at, so. God, I wish I had been playing at 30 year because everybody keeps saying what a great. That was by far, I think was like, I hate to say it and it sounds bad of me to say, that was, for me was like the pinnacle of the SCA. That was, I'm not saying we went down or anything, but that was like for, for an event, I, I keep saying, I keep seeing people I've seen over the years playing the SCA, I'm like, well, I really, that 30 year was great. Yeah, that was a great event. I'm like, yeah, it was. I mean, the wind was bad. It, it got a little sticky and hot some night, some days. Where they had Grand Court was on this horse thing. And you, we, I'm wearing turn shoes. So my feet are constantly hot. I mean, I talk, but I talk, I, I like 30 year more than I ever like Penzik. I haven't been to a Penzik that compares to 30 year for me. That's where I've been at. So I've been, it, nothing's compared to that. That event was very magical for me. That was the pinnacle of my magical part of the SCA. That site is here in Vancouver, and it's uh, it's a musical amphitheater venue now. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not. Um, we couldn't use it again for a big event like that. Oh, that's too bad because that yeah. was a pretty that was a pretty cool site. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Well, do you do you want to wrap up and go to the final ten, Don, or do you have more questions? Um, sure. You guys do whatever you want. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, we haven't gotten into really any of the philosophical stuff, but you've talked about some really cool things. So, okay. Uh -huh. Is there is there anything philosophically that you wanted to talk about that you're going to 
be sad that we didn't talk about when we when we stop? Um, well, it feels awful. I, I can say one thing I'll say is, uh, is the feels awful thing. I had this conversation with uh, Duke Arthur of Lockhaven a long time ago. And this is what I tell people because he started coming back playing the SC when I just was freshly knighted. And, you know, he was like an old guy that showed up and I was trying to show him the new way things are done. Like, Mike, I, I still think you can be a really good fighter if you're willing to change this. You know, he still fought with like, Gauntlet, you know, gauntleted hands with his sword, you know, Aiden Belt, we don't do that. Everything's with baskets. And, you know, if you do this and you change this about your armor, you probably have a better time fighting. You know, the stance you're doing isn't correct. He finally looked at me and said, Aaron, I'm going to let you know something. I win every day when I walk out on this field and I look around and I'm the only person that's still playing from when I played out here fighting. So I win. Like he says, people do it different, people do it better. But I'm just happy just to be here. I think a lot of people could take a moment and think about that. I mean, I, I look at the SA now, and there's a strife and this this stuff going on, and whatever side of the idea you fit on the fence you sit, I think we all need to take a step back and go appreciate we have something that we can come together, a large group of people, and participate in it. You know, I gotta think back when I played D&D as a kid. It was me and my five friends and some kitchen table somewhere, and that's it. I can now go to an event, you know, not as big as they once were. I can still go to a pretty good-sized event where there's a couple thousand people that all think like-minded like me that like something that we do. And that's what he, I took away from him telling me that. It's like, hey, I'm still here because I enjoy it. Let me enjoy what I'm doing. And I think that's the big thing we all need to remember. We enjoy what we do, and that's, I think, is a big thing we all can really think about, is enjoy it. Because it might be gone next week. It might be gone tomorrow who knows just enjoy what you have i know we're busy with families like i know you two guys are as well but when i go to an event man i just i take it all in and love it even if it's a boring court of it, like a coronation which i'm the guy in the back talking my mouth off or out in the hallway a coronation's going on i know a lot of us do that but it's just i just love being around these people every time i'm like oh, i don't know if i can go to see anymore i go to an event i'm like i miss these people so much i really do and that's yeah. for sure I think that we're all getting a big dose of perspective right now around that. We are. Yeah. We are. And I'm hoping it changes people's outlooks when we're able to socialize again. And it's now okay. And you're not going to possibly kill somebody if you hang out with them or something like that. You know, hopefully people take that in stride a little bit more. And I really think maybe a lot of us needed a break, a little bit of a break to kind of quiet things down and go, oh, I really miss what I'm doing because it's like normally the SA keeps moving when you disappear. Well, now the SA is not moving because we've all disappeared. It's just, it's all right there waiting for us to come back. So I'm looking forward to that when it happens, whatever it does. Yeah. There's my philosophical conversation. There we go. No, I, I think Thank that's you. really good. I mean, it's, it's always about the people and about the, the things that you're doing that are bringing you joy. Right. And uh, for me, like fighting is just, um, one of those activities where I can totally forget that I have a stressful job and that I have, you know, to pay bills or whatever, and I can be in the moment. And, you know, that sort of bleeds into just hanging out with my friends at the events too, because you can be in the moment. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I always joke around and go with practice. I'm like dragging my butt to go to practice sometimes nowadays. Like, oh, uh, I got to drag. But once I'm there and I put all that gear on and I'm in the moment, it's like, yeah, why, why don't I do this more often right. and miss it? So I, I get that totally. Oh, somebody says this is in the top five interviews so far. So, <laughs> all right. So let's go to the final ten. Um, Sounds good. If you could fight anyone in the world, who would it be? Fight anybody in the world. In the SCA. It whoever. The first who person would? I interviewed said Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> It wouldn't be much of a fight if I fought Donald Trump. Probably he'd not. Probably, he'd probably kill over. It might um, be first thing, though. In, in the real world, I would love, I would love to, this sounds stupid, but in, in, if I could fight a historical figure, I'd love to have a pickup fight or, or practice with Alexander the Great. Because you only hear about this legend of this person, who he was, like this age he was. I mean, in Italy, he's still this conquering hero and all this stuff that's going through and everything and what he did. You know, all that stuff, it'd be really good. And the person in the SC I would love to have fought. I never got a chance to fight. Uh, really, God. Oh, his name just left my head. Oh, no, just left my head. He lived in Calentir, and I can't remember his name. 
oh, I'm getting old. Um, or, <laughs> or the heat's gotten to me. But a person I enjoy fighting all the time is when I get to fight is Rothgar. Whenever I get a chance to fight him, it's just a great fight because it's no, it doesn't matter who wins or loses. It's just about the fight and the moment and what's going on. I love fighting against that guy. That's for sure. Who would you like to see reign in your kingdom? Who would like to see reign in my kingdom? Um, right as current right now, we have a gentleman who was uh, uh, coming back into the SCA. Uh, I'm hoping he, he might do it again, hopefully. He ran a couple times. I know you've heard the name of Duke uh, Mark Von Neumann. You've probably heard of him before from the past. You know, there's a lot of issues. I'm going to go in the past with him. But he's come back. I mean, he served 20 years in the Army. Do I agree with him politically on everything? No. Do I, along with, do I agree with everything he says? No. But I'd love to see him reign again because I think he's a, a person I've known for years. I can stay in touch with him even though he's only played in the SCA for a while. I still stay in touch with him. And uh, I'd love to see him reign again because I think it'd be a very happening experience because people have stories and legends about the person he was. And I watch him now work with – he's the guy at a stray of war that takes that guy that's in pickle barrel armor – pulls him over the corner like he like he's one of the military guys and talks that guy up big or that unit up so big that they'll charge through and hit that line so hard just to please him. And he says that moment. I think he'd be a great king for that. I think he's a great guy for that. And I think people see these, whatever his past was, his future was, you know, now I think people can see what a great guy he is and stuff like that nowadays. He's one I'd love to see reign uh, for sure. I'd love now, if you're going to talk outside of kingdom, I'd love to see Vic reign again. I think Vic would be. He's, he's crown prince. Yeah, I know he's crown. That tells you how loop I am. Somebody else step up. I mean, I'd love to see him be king of Ontario and come to Australia so I can hang out with him again. So I enjoyed <laughs> hanging out with him all those years and stuff like that. But he's, he's, I think he's an amazing king. I think how he does the role and what he does is a good guy. So, I mean, where he's at is so far away from me. I'm so, I'm closer to Mexico than I am to Canada. So it's hard for me to. <laughs> He's far away from, from us, too. I know. He's Saskatchewan, isn't he now? Is that where he's at now, or is he? He's in Edmonton, I think. Edmonton. He's still in Alberta, but um, yeah, he's back home. They, they calved off from our kingdom, so they're their own kingdom now. And Yes. You should ask him one time about being a farmer with his dad. Oh, that's hilarious stuff. I got him. He got a little drunk one night. We talked about being a farmer with his dad, and it was hilarious. Some of the stories he talked talk about that, it was just funny to listen to him talk. Anyways. Oh, Drunk Vic, the Vic Show. Yes. yes that was a great story i still hey you driving around the field he's like shut it up I'm like come on <laughs> all right if you could talk stick with anyone in the world for an hour who would it be anyone for an hour um one person oh that's rough that is rough um i i had bellatrix for an hour at 30 year so that was like that knocked my off my list there um a person i'd probably like to talk uh, stuff with God, that's hard because all the people I really admire, I got to really sit down and chit chat with them. Um, there's one person that and never gets old talking to about stick fighting or this idea of it is Alanon. Just how he gets his brain and how he works about it. He's a really good explainer of the philosophy of it that makes it relatable to anybody. He really can make it relatable to anybody. He can make it if you're a big cook, he'll somehow really fight into cooking. I don't know how he does it, but he's just really good at that stuff. <laughs> he's very good at that. He's very good at explaining things. He's a great teacher. And I've been very fortunate over the years to have, because I used to go to Lily's all the time, but when he used to live back, he'd come to Lily's all the time too. And I used to have long conversations about fighting and brain processes and how you think. I think he's doing another video right now called the SC Coaches Corner. We're going to talk to him about something like that. And that's, he's just a great mental guy to think about and stuff like that. But, yeah, I, I was super impressed with him when I talked to him. He is just, wow. Yeah, like I, I could have talked to him for three hours, probably. Yes, yeah. I did one time in Carretier. Yeah. We watched the sunrise, talk, just about fighting. Yeah. And a little bit of basketball, too. There's some basketball in there, too. All right. What is your favorite medieval-esque or period movie? Oh, I love the director's cut of, of uh, by Ripley Scott. Uh, was it Heavens? What's that one that had Orlando Bloom in it? Kingdom, oh, of Kingdom of Heaven. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, my brain's went for I told you I don't know what it is right now. Probably because I'm not in my house enough. Um, and I love the director's cut of Kingdom of Heaven. That movie's amazing. It proves to me, for all those combat archers out there, that one arrow would not kill me. I could still fight for another 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> Come on. He broke it off and his armpit and still killed 
lots of people. He died later, but hey, you know, died many days later. You know, that was my favorite. That's that's my one I like. And then Netflix just came out with one. It's called The King. It's about Henry V. If you got Netflix, that one's – it actually shows fighting in full suits of armor and how people actually died. It wasn't from getting, you know, hit with swords. They beat the bejesus out of each other. They got stomped on or they suffocated death in the mud. That's how a lot of them died. And, and they actually showed that in the, in the Netflix series, that the crushing weight of battles – and that's just, it's epic. It's really cool how they did the whole twist on Henry V. I really like that one a lot. That was a good movie. I'll have to put that in my queue. I hadn't heard of that one. It is amazing. Same. Um, it's, it's, you can see how Henry V gets manipulated by the court and to go to battle against France. And they change the angle of it a bit. You know, like, you know, this whole group gets behind him. It is awesome. It's it's a bit gory. Oh, there's some, But they have one scene where he fights this one guy. And they're full plate armor, and they're beating the bejesus out of each other. And they're not stopping. The only way the guy dies is by stabbing him in the face with a dagger. It's the only way he kills him, so it's pretty intense. Nice. Um, if you could add a rule to the rules of the list, what would it be? The list is perfect. What are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> rules of the list is perfect. Um, or you I could think... subtract. What's that? Or you could subtract. Subtract? Subtract. No. I think there's nothing I would subtract from the rules of the list. I think it's, I think it's pretty simple and straightforward how it is. I think we all, I love it because it's so broad that each can interpret its own way. That's what I love about it. I love, that's what I love about going to different kingdoms and find different kingdoms and just how they, their rules of the list or their basic set core of what it is. You know, it's pretty, that's what I love about it. It's simple. It's, it's, it's kind of like our, you know, our, you know, the bill of, you know, or Bill of Rights and all that stuff. It's pretty much there. It's there's no need to change it. You know, you can interpret it as you see it. Your kingdom can interpret it. it. Can change. I like it. You know, that's why I feel about it. All right. What is your favorite tournament format? My favorite tournament format. It used to be in my younger days. I used to love single single eliminate double elimination tournaments. You know, bring your best weapon. Bring your thing. Now, now I'm really into. I, I guess it comes with. I used to watch these old people do pot of arms, you know, now I watch them like, oh, that's so fun to do. Like, I love to fight a square up somebody in a barrier and say, you have to strike me eight times or whatever. And I love that stuff. That's just fun. Makes it more, involves the crowd more and the people watching, which I like. I love that a lot about that. So that's probably my favorite format, but I love, I love fighting. If I actually have a tournament, I love to fight in. I love, uh, it's based off the bike. I do it all the time whenever I do run a tournament. I love it. When you draw the, the, the take the flower and draw the circle, yeah. and two people square off with mass weapons, and you either hit the person or you knock them out of the circle. I love the I love those bear pit style tournaments. I love that. I love giving me an axe and just gonna go hit some people. I love that. Cool. Um, what's your favorite event? My favorite event. Um, I love wars because I get to see all my friends. It's the one time I get to see everybody. You know, I don't get to travel as much. Australia is only a couple hours away from me, from one side of town to the other. And I get to see all my friends. You, you know, people like you live in different areas will come down to Australia. I get to see everybody. I love that. I love the I love the melees. I just like the atmosphere, sit around campfires and just hanging out with a bunch of people I normally don't get to see. You know, it's just a fun time for me. So if you could have any helmet regardless of cost, what kind would it be? Any helmet regardless of cost. There is a, uh, oh man, I've always wanted, there's two helmets I've always wanted. One, as I told you, one is a Torgo helmet. Right. I'll never get one of those. And another one is, I've always wanted a helmet that has those really cool face plates that look like a human's face. Always wanted one of those. That's something I've always wanted. And it's like, my next, I don't know if I could breathe in it very well. It probably would not be the best thing to fight in long periods of time, but I've always wanted to look like that. I don't care what it looks like. It could be whatever period I'd make the rest of the armor match, but it's one of those cool face plates with like, it could be a Norman conical with a nasal and a helmet face. I mean, I just love that. It'd be so cool to have. Cool. Um, it's Saturday morning at Australia and several people want to talk to you about last night. What did you do? The, the night before what I did? Um, usually it's, oh God, do we ever go to bed? That's the first question. Um, now, now we do, now we do go to bed. Um, like we just, I guess I, the sad part about me now 
at a stray war, it's I find a group of my friends, wherever they are, we bring chairs together and we sit there all night long. So I usually sit there till we go to bed. I'm very bad at partying anymore, like going from place to place. I find a group of my friends, we pull up a bunch of chairs and that's where we make our home. Whoever camp it's at. This part, right? Like, yes. Fire, talking to your friends. Yes. Maybe a little. Yep. Yes. And a lot of BS from the day of uh, during the day. Hey, you see what we did to so and so? Oh, yeah, we got them pretty good. <laughs> All right. Um, who's your favorite fight ever? My favorite fight ever. Um, Alanon. Alanon and Rothgar are two of my favorite fights. I always have to bring everything. There's no question. I got to bring everything when I fight those two guys. They're like my best fights. I have a lot of good fights with Craven, but we're both lefties and it's awkward. You know, he does his sombrero thingy and I try to push him around because I'm bigger than him. But my two fights, man, that every day that like I come 100%, I'm zeroed in focus is fighting those two guys. I'm always ready to fight. It's just, it, no matter how tired I am, I get a chance to fight him. I just love it. Cool. All right. And the bonus question is who is the cleanest fighter in your kingdom? The cleanest fighter in my kingdom. Well, of course, it's me. Of course. The cleanest fighter. In no, um, uh, probably the cleanest fighter I've ever seen. He doesn't play anymore. Um, i trying to think who else. The cleanest fighter. I think, wow. I think one thing I'll say about our kingdom, and this is not me trying to get out of it, but I, I really feel, I really, we don't have any of those, those guys where we're like, that are just so overly bad. Probably the, the cleanest fun fight I ever had was probably with Craven because we kept, you know, talking to each other. Like, no, no, that wasn't hard enough. You sure? I'm like, no, it wasn't. Okay. You know, like I tried to take a shot. No, no, don't take that. You know, and then vice versa. You know, that's probably my most cleanest fight I've ever had. But I think in a whole, I really feel, one thing I'm very proud of our kingdom because probably because we're all on top of each other there's nobody who can sneak away and have any issues ever. It's pretty much you're on top of each other and you pretty much know what's going on. So a lot of people are very clean. The, the most amazing I ever see is this another Elanon story. This guy has got the, the cleanest fight ever. He fought some guy in a, in a, a outlands tourney and he couldn't hit him. Whatever reason he couldn't hit the guy. Wasn't taking shots, whatever, whatever you want to call. He wasn't calling the guy's honor. He wasn't saying anything. He finally just said, this is the finals of the Outlands Prize Tourney, by the way. He saluted him and said, for some reason, my arm is not strong enough. I cannot beat you. And I yield the field to you. And walked off the field and said, and I have no ill remorse. It's just I'm not, for some reason, my fight is not there today. And he walked off the field. Before he got angry and mad and upset, he walked off the field. And this guy was like, well, oh, I didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. But it just made, it made you pause for a moment. If one guy is willing just to walk off, just to not try to prove a point. Me, on the other hand, I've been trying to smash the guy even harder and make him take the shot. <laughs> Alanon's like, nope, I'm just, my arm's not good enough today. I'm just going to yield the field to you. Right. Your prowess is better than mine. And that just, I, I don't know if I could ever do that. That would be hard for me to do. I wish I had known that story before I interviewed him because. <laughs> well, we all stood around watching him. Because Did you just walk I'm off the field? What a cool way to like, just, you know, not get angry, just leave and be like, you know, it's not about winning. It's about having a good fight. And if I can't bring the fight that this guy is obviously demanding, then let's just be done. Yep. That's the way he was. I can't bring your fight to you. That's pretty I awesome. thought that was, really, that was really cool. I mean, it was amazing. He's done some stuff like that throughout the years that just, I, we, I've been to a couple of lilies over the years and he had a couple of guys that come out of the woodwork. You're like, Whoa, that guy's a tank. How is he, what's he going to take? And he just make him feel about this big, and that was about it. And I'm like, wow. I was like trying to brutalize the guy. You got him with words. I was trying to beat him up. That was pretty impressive. So that's super impressive. Well, thank you so much for uh, talking to us. We've had a lot of fun tonight, and um, it's been really super interesting. So, Thanks. Yeah. If, if you ever want to ask me anything, you know, don't get a hold of me. I love I love chit chatting. So I'm one of those okay. bad people that will talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Especially now, my wife is probably tired of me talking about God knows what, so. <laughs> we all need a little bit of uh, interaction with people who we aren't married to right now. Yes. <laughs> kind of important. Yes. <laughs> I'm not killing my children right now. She's probably ecstatic about it. Oh. <laughs> so, Shaxi, uh, I forgot who we're, who we're talking to next week. Who are we talking to next week? Do you remember? Um, 
I think it's Joanna. Hold on. She pulls out the book of knowledge. So tomorrow I'm talking to Duke Skaggy, but that's not going to be a sister's interview, but that should be super fun because that guy is just um, he's fun. A hoot. Yeah, he's a hoot. And I think- Ask him about his big mohawk. Yeah, he's had some hair, like some- He had a 30 hair. <laughs> you know why you forgot next week? Oh, because we're interviewing each other. Oh, because next week we are, are the person that we were going to interview hasn't confirmed. So we're going to interview each other. So if you ever wanted to ask us a question, um, please send us questions. Um, otherwise, we're just going to um, talk about what we want to talk about, which might not be um, all that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you need help making it one of the top 10 interviews. Yes, right? like we have to be in the top five. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, and next Tuesday, I'm interviewing on a branch of Laurels, which is Kiva, um, who is doing some really interesting natural dye work with um, some of her local um, indigenous tribes. So um, that is yeah, awesome. She's, yeah, she's super cool. So does she make all the stuff and then weave it together and then make something out of it? She one of those people. She, um, she, she does. She, uh, that's part of what she was laureled for. But right now she's working with uh, native tribes to kind of rekindle uh, their knowledge of natural dye stuffs that they've oh, lost. Wow. And so she's dyeing things using local plants for uh, tribal artisans. And they're using the stuff that she's dyed to weave wow. with. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah. So, that's, that's making a difference. Yeah. It's taking a, a game you play and interest and then actually putting it on real world stuff, which is amazing. Yeah. That is absolutely amazing. She's next level, so that's going to be fun. Yes. So thanks again, and thanks everybody for joining us. And I really appreciate your time, Aaron. This was awesome. Thank so. you very much, guys. It's been fun. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.